This is the mission commander, Rick Searfoss, an Air Force colonel, on his third mission and first as mission commander. Scott Altman, a Navy commander, making his first flight into space. Rick Linehan, a NASA veterinarian astronaut, is a payload commander and on his second flight. Kay Heyer, MS-2, the flight engineer of the mission, will be making her first flight. Dave Williams, the Canadian astronaut, also on his first flight. Dave is an emergency physician. Jay Bucky, PS1, a medical doctor on loan from Dartmouth Medical School. This is Jim Powelsik, a physician from Penn State, also making his first flight with Neurolab. Finally, on launch day, the shuttle was ready to go, and the crew made their traditional walkout from crew quarters as they boarded the Astro van to take them to the pad for strap into the vehicle. We climbed into the vehicle about two hours prior to launch and waited for time to go, closed and locked our visors as the moment approached. Ten seconds prior to launch, the water suppression system is activated and the engines come online. Then at T-minus zero, the solid rocket boosters kick off and there's no doubt in any of our minds that we are going into space. In this in-cabin video view, you can see how things start shaking as those solid rocket boosters light off. The feeling of acceleration was incredible as we headed up and accelerated faster and faster. It was a beautiful day at Kennedy Space Center, and just a gorgeous way to start the mission. At about two minutes into the mission, the solid rocket boosters have uh, expended most of their thrust and are jettisoned. You can see the flash outside the windows as the solid rocket boosters come off. This onboard view shows the solid rockets detaching as their uh, motors fire from the nose cone. You can see the exhaust as it goes out of sight. This happens at about 170,000 feet. As I said, two minutes into the mission, doing a little better than twice the speed of sound. The solids come back down to Earth and are actually reused for the next flight. At main engine cutoff, eight and a half minutes into the mission, you can see us all pitch forward as we're now in zero G for the first time in the mission. Shortly after that, we jettison the external tank. It actually re-enters the atmosphere and burns up uh, over the Indian Ocean is the only piece that is not reused. Here you can see the external tank starting to vent off the oxygen and hydrogen propellant that's left on board as it re-enters the atmosphere. This is some spectacular footage of our external tank. Now it's time to open up the payload bay doors and get down to work. The payload bay doors are actually radiators that help reject heat into space, the heat that's produced by all the equipment and experiments that we have on board. You can see the space lab in the background there in the left corner of the picture. That'll be our home while we're doing all our experiments for the next 16 days. We deploy the KU band, which is the antenna that handles the high data uh, transmission rate for the video and high bandwidth data that needs to go back and forth to the ground. Now it's time for Rick and Dave to open the hatches and get ready to activate the space lab. This shows the uh, inside of the space lab, and this is where we're going to be doing the uh, 26 experiments that we have on the mission. Uh, Rick and Dave <coughs> had the job to come on in and get it uh, activated to get the power on. Here's the tunnel, actually, that connects to the space lab. The space lab sits so far back in the payload bay, and that's the tunnel that we go through in order to get into the space lab. Uh, their job is to uh, get the power on, the lights on, and uh, get it ready for starting uh, with the activities there. You can see once it gets going, it's a pretty busy place. We have at least uh, three experiments going on here right now. In the back is a rotating chair, but then here at the bottom is uh, a study looking at blood pressure control. You can see Dave is inside that uh, silver tank, 
And uh, also, here's our commando, Rick Searfoss, is also participating in one of these experiments, looking at how the blood pressure control system changes uh, when you're in space. Down at the bottom left here, you can see that Jim is working inside that uh, silver canister called an LBMP tank, and he's actually doing something for the first uh, time ever in space. He's doing what's called marconerography. On the ground, the investigators are watching this pretty closely because this was the first time, and they were pretty excited to see if it would work out. And when Jim got that, uh, that nerve and the tracings, they were pretty excited. This is the rotating chair, and uh, this is used for studying another system that's affected by being uh, in space, and that's the balance system. Uh, this gives you a little sense about uh, how fast the chair rotates once it gets going. And just keep in mind, however, when you're rotating in the chair, you actually don't see out. Uh, what you have instead is cameras looking at your eye movements. And these show the eye movements when you're uh, rotating in the chair. And by studying those eye movements, the investigators can get a sense on how the balance system has changed from being in space. The chair also goes in the different positions. Before, you saw it sitting upright, and that was lying on the back. These experiments didn't just take place in space. They also took place before and after the mission. Here's Scott doing the ball catch experiment. This was part of the baseline data collection before the mission. You can see he has apparatus on there that's measuring the uh, um, activities in his muscles when he catches the ball. This shows the markers on the hand that's uh, used for measuring the ball catch. And here he is doing it in space. And here it's a lot different because the ball is uh, falling at a constant speed rather than constantly accelerating as it does on the ground. And there's the catch. We also use virtual reality to get a sense of how our orient sense of orientation changed in space. Inside this virtual reality helmet, you see a scene that's rotating. And it uh, turns out that when you look at this scene, you actually start to get a sense that you're rotating uh, rather than that the room is rotating. And uh, we noticed that that uh, was more profound in space. We were also looking at how control of movement changed. And this is the visual motor coordination facility. Uh, that looks at how our control of movements and simple movements like grasping and pointing change. Uh, lung function also changes in space, and this is Dave uh, working on a, a pulmonary experiment from the University of California at San Diego. We weren't the only uh, animals being studied on the mission. We also had rats, mice, uh, fish, uh, snails and uh, on the mission. And here's a cage transfer. We're taking some uh, rats over to the general purpose workstation to see how they've adapted to being in space. And we're going to show two, uh, two experiments that we did in the workstation. Uh, the first one used what's called a uh, Escher staircase. And this shows uh, one of the prints from MC Escher. And if you look at that staircase, you see it's a little confusing about what's up and what's down. The Escher staircase we had in the workstation looked like this. And it turns out that when a rat walks on this maze, they're actually making three 90-degree turns, but they come back to the same starting point. And this can help understand how their brain is uh, controlling their sense of orientation. This display actually shows uh, nerve cells in the brain firing when they get to certain locations. We also had rats that were learning to walk in space. And you can see this rat here is using its front legs. And this one is uh, just enjoying floating around. And uh, they adapted pretty much the way we did, since we tended to use our arms and float around, too, when we were out in the space lab. This is a picture of an oyster toadfish. And it turns out that the balance system of fish isn't all that different uh, from that of humans. And by studying nerve impulses from uh, the fish, you can get some uh, insights into how the balance system is working. Here, K is uh, giving some accelerations to the aquarium where the uh, toadfish was. We also had crickets on board, 2,000 crickets. And here, uh, Scott is uh, looking at these uh, crickets. Some of them are in a centrifuge that you saw spinning around there, and others are floating around in the uh, uh, weightlessness of space. They actually have gravity sensors, and you can see what happens to gravity sensors when they uh, develop in space. Each orbit of the Earth took 90 minutes, so every 45 minutes we had a sunrise or a sunset. In between performing all the experiment activities, we had to take care of daily activities such as exercising to try and stay in shape while we were on orbit for 16 days, and of course just uh, cleaning up and general chores uh, such as washing your hair and also uh, shaving and taking care of brushing your teeth and 
things like that that just took a little bit longer in space uh, since we had the challenge of performing these activities without gravity. Every now and then, if we did have a spare moment or two, it was pretty fun to take advantage of practicing uh, the laws of physics with the lack of gravity. And we also uh, had a challenge every time we went to go eat, so we had to gather all of our food up, the majority of which was dehydrated food that we added water to in our galley and put into our oven, used scissors to open the special packages, and then we just uh, pull the food out and eat that with just regular utensils. And it didn't really matter if you were on the floor or on the ceiling. Another uh, interesting thing that happens on orbit is you actually grow taller as the effect of gravity is no longer there on your spine. Some crew members as much as two inches, and here we're taking turns measuring that growth. Another experiment performed were sleep studies, where we have this uh, neural net on to measure brain waves, as well as a special suit that has instrumentation that measures chest wall movement for respiration recording, and a special data recorder that's miniaturized that is actually worn on the subject to record all the signals while they sleep. We also performed observation of the Earth as it went by underneath us. We photographed this with still cameras and video cameras, getting uh, super images such as this one as we're entering the Mediterranean, looking there at Gibraltar. We had a variety of cameras to record this, these images as they went by. Here you can see the Green Nile area as well as the Red Sea and the colorful desert around it. Here, commander of the mission, Rick Searfoss, has a 400 millimeter lens attached to a 35 millimeter camera and taking more detailed photographs. Here you can see some sun glint on the coast of North Carolina, the Cape Hatteras area. And we also had uh, still cameras in uh, 70 millimeter and also the 35 mentioned before. Here you can see Baja, California, again with a bit of sun glint on it. While we were on orbit, we had the opportunity to make a communications link with the Russian space station Mir and had the chance to talk to fellow astronaut Andy Thomas. During the course of the 16-day mission, we need to practice to keep our skills sharp, especially for being ready to re-enter and land the orbiter at the Kennedy Space Center. Here we have a special computer with a simulator software program on board called Pilot. Both the commander and the pilot were able to use this to retain their skills and receive the feedback of a score for every run that they accomplished. Also during the mission, we uh, performed different link-ups for public affairs purposes and uh, able to complete some of those. Before the end of our 16-day mission started wrapping up with the sun setting here and getting ready to prepare the vehicle for re-entry. While on orbit, we pulled everything out and utilized all the equipment for our experiments, but that meant that we had to put it all away before we came back down to the Earth. So as you can see, the lab was pretty full earlier and now putting everything away. We also had to pull the seats back out here on the mid-deck and also up on the flight deck where we had stowed them for the orbital period. Now we had to reinstall them for the entry. While we're on orbit, everything seems to uh, grow as it takes longer to try to restow everything in the small lockers they were stowed in on the way uphill. Go ahead and close the payload bay doors here to reconfigure the orbiter to get it ready to become a glider to re-enter the atmosphere. Our deorbit burn took place about an hour prior to landing and some 12,000 miles away, basically on the other side of the world. We re-entered the atmosphere 4,000 miles away from Kennedy Space Center at an altitude of about 400,000 feet. It was a great view for me as the pilot looking out the right side of my window as we were in a right bank coming over San Francisco, Las Vegas, and out uh, near Texas. Really felt low after being at 150 miles in space to now be down at 200,000 feet as during part of the re-entry. The shuttle enters at a 20 degree glide slope, then pulls up uh, during the landing phase as we flare to land. Here you can see runway 33 at Kennedy Space Center that we are landing on as we're getting ready to come into the final flare. The landing gear are lowered at about 300 feet, 
and then the mission commander hand flies the orbiter in for a smooth touchdown on the runway, about 2,000 feet down from the end. Once we've touched down, we keep the nose in the air at first, deploy the drag chute to help us slow down, and then smoothly lower the nose. The drag chute uh, almost makes the brakes not required as it slows us down very rapidly. We let it go at about 60 knots so that it won't contact any of the shuttle main engine bells during the uh, deceleration. Although it, it might seem that the mission's over with our landing, it's actually not. There's a lot of data collection ahead for us for both the human subjects and for the animals on board to see how we readapt to 1G after a 16-day mission in 0G. But before that can happen, we need to get the convoy out to make sure that the orbiter is safe to, uh, and to be ready to service the vehicle. Then we had a chance that evening after some data collection to get back out and take a look at the orbiter. Neuralab used outer space to explore inner space. Our results will not only help astronauts, but also people on Earth as well. This is the mission commander, Rick Searfoss, an Air Force colonel on his third mission and first as mission commander. Scott Altman, a Navy commander, making his first flight into space. Rick Linehan, a NASA veterinarian astronaut, is a payload commander and on his second flight. Kay Heyer, MS-2, the flight engineer of the mission, will be making her first flight. Dave Williams, the Canadian astronaut, also on his first flight. Dave is an emergency physician. Jay Bucky, PS-1, a medical doctor, on loan for... At about two minutes into the mission, the solid rocket boosters have uh, expended most of their thrust and are jettisoned. You can see the flash outside the windows as the solid rocket boosters come off. This onboard view shows the solid rockets detaching as their uh, motors fire from the nose cone. You can see the exhaust as it goes out of sight. This happens at about 170,000 feet as I said, two minutes into the mission, doing a little better than twice the speed of sound. Water suppression system is activated and the engines come online. Then at T minus zero, the solid rocket boosters kick off and there's no doubt in any of our minds that we are going into space. In this in-cabin video view, you can see how things start shaking as those solid rocket boosters light off. The feeling of acceleration was incredible as we headed up and accelerated faster and faster. It was a beautiful day at Kennedy Space Center, just a gorgeous way to start the mission. The solids come back down to Earth and are actually reused for the next flight. At main engine cutoff, eight and a half minutes into the mission, you can see us all pitch forward as we're now in zero G for the first time in the mission. Shortly after that, we jettison the external tank it actually re-enters the atmosphere and burns up uh, over the Indian Ocean is the only piece that is not reused. Here you can see the external tank starting to vent off the oxygen and hydrogen propellant that's left on board as it re-enters the atmosphere. This is some spectacular footage of our external tank. Now it's time to Dartmouth Medical School. This is Jim Powelsik, a physician from Penn State, also making his first flight with Neurolab. Finally, on launch day, the shuttle was ready to go and the crew made their traditional walk out from crew quarters as they boarded the Astro van to take them to the pad for strap into the vehicle. We climbed into the vehicle about two hours prior to launch and waited for time to go, closed and locked our visors as the moment approached. Ten seconds prior to launch, the 